genes, predicted genes present in that area, one, two, three, four, and five. So we know that our gene is present between this and this marker, so it has to be one of these five genes. But then we have to narrow it down, which one out of these five genes? Then you look at the sequences of each of these genes and try to see, predict what kind of function this particular protein may be playing. And here, these are the five genes. And on this side, I wrote the predicted functions. What kind of role it may be playing in the cell. Pretty complex names here. I'm not going to go into too much detail here. But one of them, this one, it is involved in meiotic uh, recombination and cytokinesis. So that is the process which is involved in formation of sperms and eggs. That directly links it to fertility. Sperm said that eggs, that's what was not working in the sterile plant. So maybe this is our gene of interest. So at that time, maybe. So we were not sure, we could not rule out whether other four are really involved in the process or not. But if, if you remember, we started all that from assuming that this mutant was generated by a transposable element. So if this muta mutant was generated by a transposable element, we should be able to find which one out of these five is really our gene of interest. So first thing, we had to prove that it is due to transposable element. So we had those plants, which I told you, F2 generation. Sterile plant, fertile plant, sterile plant, fertile plant. H means it has both type of patterns. So then we looked at the transposone and used the transposone to see the pattern of transposone in each of these plants. So here this arrow indicates pattern of transposone. It is present. It is missing, present, 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 missing. Whenever you have this transposone missing, it is going to be fertile. It is missing, it is fertile. So because transposone was making it sterile, if transposone is not there, it has to be fertile. So wherever you see it missing, it is going to be fertile. We had only uh, 12 plants, so J.D. Pravel was working on this. And he was like, oh, it is too much work. Let's start with smaller sample. So we started with 12, see if it makes sense. Then we can extend that to a large number of samples. So it made perfect sense. And then we increased the sample size to 88 plants. So in 88 plants, again, if you follow this band now, missing fertile, missing fertile, missing fertile, missing fertile, perfect association. Whenever this band is missing, it is going to be fertile. So this gave us pretty good confidence that transposone is causing the mutation, and that's why this plant is sterile. So now we know that transposone is causing this mutation. That, that means we should be able to find the gene, because we already have the sequence of the transposone. So we should know where this transposone is sitting. We should be able to find the part which is right next to the transposome. So for that, we use this approach called as genome walking. So in this approach, you take the DNA. So this is sterile sample. So you take the sterile sample. You cut the DNA into smaller pieces. So you make the smaller pieces. And this is the green part is the fertility gene broken by transposome. So in sterile sample, Fertility gene is broken by transposable element. So that's what it is showing. Then what we do is we may artificially make DNA attached to the end of these pieces. We call those adapters. And we know everything about those adapters, complete sequence of those adapters. So we attach these blue adapters to ends of these fragments. As we know the sequence of these adapters, we can actually copy these fragments. If you want to copy DNA, what you need is a starter. A starter DNA molecule, which can be further extended, which we call as primer. So we designed primers 
in this part because we knew the uh, sequence of all these adapters. And also, we designed primers for the transposon. We already knew the sequence of transposon. So we used those sequence to make the starter DNA primers. So these primers are going to bind here, blue ones to blue, and red one here, red to the transposon. If you want to copy that, you can copy DNA, but there is one big limitation. Limitation is your primers can't be too far away. If they are too far away, the enzyme which copies, it cannot do it. For example, in this case, these two are too far away for the enzyme to copy the whole thing, does not work. Too far away, does not work. Too far away, does not work. These two are close enough. It will be able to copy that. These two close enough, it will be able to copy that. So it is going to make these fragments. You see it copied that piece. Now same thing you are going to do on the fertile sample. This is sterile sample. There's little difference in fertile sample now. In fertile sample, there is no transposon. Fertility gene is intact. So there is no transposon present there. You do the same thing. You cut the DNA, smaller pieces, and then you are going to put the adapters, use the primers. Now there is no transposon there, so you don't even need transposon. Primer, even if you do that, it is not going to work because transposon is in, not even there. If you try to copy this, too far, too far, too far, this is also too far, not going to work. This is the only one which is going to work. So you can tell sterile different from fertile. If you compare these two now, in the sterile sample, you had two fragments copied, whereas in fertile, there is only one fragment copied. And you run it on a gel, you'll be able to see two fragments in the sterile, only one fragment in the fertile. This fragment, which is present in both, we are not interested in that. We are only interested in differences between fertile and sterile. So this is something which is present in sterile but missing in fertile. So we are interested in this. And if you look at real picture, real picture looks like that. So where you have sterile, fer fertile, sterile, fertile, sterile, fertile, sterile, fertile. And you look at this band, present in sterile, missing in fertile. Present in sterile, missing in fertile, present in sterile, missing in fertile. So, and then this one, actually this lane did not work. Still, we just picked one band out of that, say, try our luck. <clears throat> so we sequenced these fragments to see what we got. So this is the four sequences which we got from those bands which we cut. And below here is the transposon sequence, which we already had before to compare this with the new sequences. These four sequences, this part is exactly same as the transposon. So this is matching with this, this part. Then what is this part? That is what we are interested in. So this is transposon. What is this? That should be the gene where transposon is sitting. So that is the part we were interested in. We took this part and compared with the soybean genome sequence, and it gave us this gene, glima 16 g 07850 So that is the name of the gene. So if you remember, we'll go back to that map again to show you this gene. But this gene is making a protein called as helicase. Helicase is a protein which opens up DNA. DNA is double-stranded. So it is going to open up double-stranded into single strand which will normally happen when the DNA is copied, DNA replication, and it will also happen during sexual reproduction when genetic information is exchanged, which makes perfect sense that something goes wrong during exchange of information and the plant became sterile. And this is the same map, uh, map I showed you before when we were doing fine mapping. There were five genes present, and the first one was Glima 16. 07850. So it confirmed that this is our gene of interest, which is helicase, and that is the gene which was making plant fertile, but if something goes wrong with that, plant became sterile.
So even if you try to publish this work, you, this proof is not enough. You'll have to give more evidence that that is really uh, the gene and the transposon was breaking that. So we had to do some more tests. One more test is we know that this is transposable element and it's not going to sit there forever. So if you grow these plants, now sterile plants, if you grow these sterile plants, in some of these sterile plants, transposon is going to jump out of this fertility gene and is going to make it fertile again. So this is transposable element sitting in this fertility gene. Plant is sterile. Now it jumps out. This gene is intact now, and this plant will become fertile. At least part of this plant will become fertile. If you look at the same plant here, this, is, this part is all sterile. One of the branches is fertile here. So in the same plant, half plant is sterile, half plant is fertile. So when you explain that, what is happening at DNA level, there are two pairs of chromosomes present. So you have two pairs of chromosomes present in all higher organisms. One comes from father, one comes from mother. If it is sterile branch, both copies should be broken. So green represents the gene, uh, fertility gene, and red represents the transposable element sitting in there. So both copies should be broken in there. That's why it is sterile. But when the branch was forming, so there is this bud present which was going to grow into this branch. In that bud, in one of the chromosomes, this transposable element jumped out. When it jumped out, now this gene is intact. That made this plant, this branch of this plant fertile. Although this was broken, but one copy of the gene is enough to make it fertile. So that is what's happening at genetic level. Then we, if you zoom on this part, same thing, fertility gene broken by transposable element. Here it jumped out. Same thing from the last slide, a little bigger. So now we wanted to test whether that is the case. If that is true, if you dwell primers from the fertility gene, so this green part, so these are two primers, starter DNA on both sides, there is a big transposable element sitting in the middle. This copying process should not work because there is transposable element in the, um, in the middle. On this side, this is again should not work, but here, when transposable element jumps out, these two primers, they come very close to each other. So it should work. It should be able to amplify this fragment. So when we did the experiment, so this is the experiment where you have soybean cultivar called at Williams 82, that is normal, normal fertile soybean. It should be able to amplify this gene because there the fertility gene is intact. But now it should not work in sterile branch. So these two are sterile branch. They are two different plants we had. So in these sterile branch, does not work. There's no band here. These two are fertile branches. It works fine. So that was confirmation that that is what's happening. It is jumping out here, and that's why that branch is fertile. So then we wanted to reconfirm that we designed another set of primers, and now this primer is coming from the transposon. So one primer is same, but the other primer is coming from the transposon. Transposon primer is very close to this other primer, so this should work fine. So this should be able to amplify that. On this, this should not work. If it jumped out, it should not work, whereas this should work fine. So they are close enough. If you use these primers, it should be able to amplify sterile branch, should be able to amplify from the fertile branch. So that is the test showing these two are sterile branches, these two are fertile branches, and you see band present in both of them. So that was ultimate proof that this is what is happening. It jumped out, 
and now you see the real phenotype, it became fertile, and the genetic data, molecular data, they are all supporting uh, our model. <clears throat> so when you look at different types of transposable elements, we, when we looked at the literature, some of the transposable elements, they leave some footprint behind. When they jump out, they leave a piece in the DNA from where they jump out. So we wanted to test whether our transposable element leaves something behind when it jumps out or not. So we took the fertile branches from both the plants, there are two plants, so we took the fertile branches and sequenced that part which we used to amplify that and compared that with the original gene which I told you glima 16 G whatever that number was to compare with this sequence whether there is any difference in the new sequence versus the real sequence of the gene. Below here, which you can't see here, it is showing you comparison of new gene versus the original gene. And lines indicate that they match perfectly. So there is no difference between the fertile branch and the original copy of the, of the sequence. So that tells you that this transposable element, as it jumps out, does not leave anything behind. So gene is intact as it was before jumping. So that is, that is very interesting. <clears throat> so then once we had this gene, so we know we got the gene, we wanted to see, is there any other gene in soybean which is similar to that and may be involved in fertility? So we took this sequence compared with complete genome sequence and try to see if there are any other sequences which are exactly like that sequence. And we were able to come up with three other sequences which had very high similarity to our gene of interest. Here it is showing you our gene of interest and other three sequences. Here letter says FFF, so FFF, that means it is same in all of them. Some part of the protein is very, very highly uh, similar in all these. And then we looked at where are these new sequences on soybean chromosome, where do they map? So this is the first one which we identified present on chromosome 16. Other three, they are present on different chromosome, chromosome 6, chromosome 8, chromosome 15. The objective of this experiment was to see we had so many fertility genes, is any of those fertility genes mapping locations similar to these genes? If that is the case, we can consider these as putative candidates for other fertility genes. But unfortunately, it did not happen. So these sequences, they do not match with mapping location of any other genes we, we have uh, used. Then we wanted to see this sequence, which is helicase, how closely it matches in other organisms, other plants, in fungi, and in even in humans, rats, we found that similar sequence is actually present in large numbers.